Hey everybody, welcome on our channel. In this video we are gonna see, what if Naruto got harem with Asla, Toph and Tylee. Part 3. If you are new on the channel, don't forget to subscribe our channel and like the video too. So without wasting any more time. Let's start the story. The green silk dress she was wearing, accentuated her toned legs and frame, along with her earthen covered bare feet, her dark black bangs that usually hid her beautiful face was in a bone. Toph Beifrong did not get nervous. Toph Beifrong did not feel anxious. Toph Beifrong did not have butterflies fluttering in her stomach. She felt a gust of wind before a male voice said, well hello there Toph Chan. I'm glad to see I got the dress measurements right. Jumping at least three feet, she spun around ready to attack until she felt the familiar powerful steps that exhumed bright confidence even in this darkness. Angrily, she asked, where were you? You had me waiting out here for 15 minutes you know. She couldn't help but bristle in annoyance at the fact he had kept her waiting for so long. Looking sheepish for a moment Naruto answered her, sorry, Toph Chan I had business to take care of. Humming down, she asked him, why do you call me Chan? What does that mean? In my language you add the suffix Chan to a cute girl or a young child to show close affection, and from what I can see you're anything but a child. Toph let out a growl as she folded her arms over her chest. So you show your true colors. You're nothing but a pervert. She accused the blonde who began to chuckle. Hey, I'm just a guy who isn't afraid to flirt, doesn't mean I'm just a pervert you know. I mean the worst thing that can result of asking someone on a date after all is rejection and how else would courting begin. Like for instance I didn't ask you wouldn't be now here would you? He said as Toph raised an eyebrow. Let's just go. She said as she held out an arm. Well. Well all those etiquette classes and tutoring for the proper young missus her parents had her attended was boring and annoyed her to no end, she knew if she didn't show some aptitude for the classes, her parents would endlessly pester her about being a proper woman, and keep sending her to classes until she got it right. Of course, my lady. He said as they linked arms and made way to their destination. As you are aware of Ba Sing Si is being ran from the shadows. He said as Ta flinched at his change of demeanor, don't stop moving. Keep going. He whispered to her as they continued walking. You let them follow us. Toph hissed, picking up on the shadow footsteps of the Dai Li. I'm taking care of it at the moment. An illusion he said as Toph raised her eyebrow and looked at the blonde, trying to use her detection ability to gauge his heart rate and vibration in his movements, to gauge his facial expressions. I can use something called Gain Jutsu which uses my chakra to cast illusions on people. We'll be able to easily escape them as a result. He assured her as the presence of the Dai Li lessened. Though there is another reason I brought this up. I want to show you something tough, but I want your permission first. I want you to trust me. He said as they came to a stop in front of a tea shop. I don't know you that well. I'm not sure if I can give my trust so freely. At least give it some thought. I'm not going to intentionally hurt you or force anything on you that you don't want. Toph steadied her senses as she read his heartbeat. He wasn't lying from what she could tell, so she decided to trust him. Okay I trust you. She said as felt him place two fingers to her forehead. Suddenly her mind was soon flooded with an overwhelming amount of the power, as her senses were flooding with an assault of colors and objects. What what is this? Toph asked as she almost stammered. I she couldn't help but feel confused and had no idea where the hell they were. One moment they were in the city and now she could feel something surrounding her on all sides. From what she could make out they were most likely trees, she could see. How? She whispered as she looked around at what she assumed were colors. Bain Jutsu I'm flooding your mind with images that I've seen myself. I figured since you're blind you wouldn't have any visual imagery, even in dreams, so you're seeing the world how I see it. Since one needs eyes to interpret images and send messages to the brain, I figured that it might have been possible for me to pull this off. So, what do you think? He asked as Toph looked around the forest, a warm glow washing over her instead of Ba Sing Si's night chilly air. For the first time her pale green eyes could see everything. She could see her hands, she could see what she saw wearing, and she could see Naruto. Hey you have whiskers like a moose cat. She said as Naruto raised an eyebrow. Something tells me I'm better off not knowing. So with that their date consisted of Naruto showing a world Toph had never been able to see. Colors, shapes, and other glorious sights were only limited by his mind. Naruto would will into existence lakes, fireworks, and even replay some of Naruto's past battles like a show. In that one night Toph was able to see more things than she ever had in her entire life. The latest of these little trips were that off a moonlit ride in a gondola, as an imagery band was playing soft music while floating in the air. Toph rested her head on Naruto's shoulder, place a hand over his. Her breath quickened as she felt his cheek come arrest on her head. Toph began feeling an unfamiliar yearn. Her heart slowly began beating in her chest as if it wanted to jump out, especially when he wrapped an arm around her. Come on Toph. Keep it together soldier. You're not one of those girly girls that get all squealy over some guy. 
you kick ass not give ass damn it. She was so lost in thought she didn't notice the scenery change and nearly tripped before she caught herself. Holy shit was he always this tall. Toph thought as re-examining them she came about to only his chest. Tall, powerful, likes to cut loose and have fun. I suppose I could do worse. She reasoned as she thought back to that little intermission when they stopped into a restaurant into a shady side of town and got into brawl. Now that was something more to her liking. Ah tunked. She thought as she grabbed him by the collar and pulled him down for a kiss. For a moment Naruto was startled but began smiling as he placed his hands around her narrow waist. He deepened the kiss as his hand softly worked her hips. After a few moments the kiss broke, with Toph smirking and Naruto grinning. Wow you definitely go for what you want huh? Not the type to mince words you're an interesting guy sky guy and I'm liking what I'm seeing so far. Now get your sexy fass over here and finish what you started. Don't you mean what you started? He asked as he pressed his forehead against hers. Just shut up and kiss me. He didn't bother to answer with words but delivered another hot kiss that she eagerly devoured her arms tightening around his neck. Toph moaned into the kiss as Naruto scooped her up, not even breaking the kiss as he placed her on a bed he materialized their hands trailing the other's form as the kisses intensified and the sensations to lead them on as they enjoyed each other's presence. Toph began groaning when suddenly Naruto's hand suddenly began groping and massaging her backside. Toph pressed against the blonde as he began massaging her cheeks, causing new sensations she didn't know exist flow through her. Toph was anything but a shy girl and decided she liked the sensation and decided she liked the feeling of being thought of as sexy. She let out a startled gasp when the blonde suddenly picked her up, still holding and groping her by the cheeks, as he continued to passionately kiss her. Under any circumstance being separated from the ground would have freaked Toph out, but this passionate action kept her calm and made her feel safe. That same night in the other part of the Earth Kingdom, another duo were in a bar, getting a drink, as their search seemed trapped in an endless loop of almost catch up to their target, only to just miss her. And what the hell are you laughing at? June demanded, as she swayed a bit and drunkenly glared at the blonde. Now come on June don't be like that. Naruto remarked with a shrug. Of course he was nothing more than just a perfected clone the original created using a blend of yin and yang, with the his chakra and sage energy. I thought drunks were usually happy, at least that's what I always heard or saw. I'm not drunk okay. She slurred slightly. And I don't need you playing babysitter either. I'm a big girl. I took care of myself long before you showed up. She said as she jabbed her finger into his chest with her finger. Boo. Those dark eyes are all sexy when you're angry. He teased her as she nearly tipped over only for Naruto to catch her. And I suppose you almost fell over on purpose right? I, I would have caught myself. She mumbled as she pushed herself off. So if you excuse me I'm going to be on my way. She said as she began to storm off. Pamps the other way June. He called out to her with a smirk. It's a shortcut. She remarked and let out a cry when Naruto scooped her up in his arms. What are you doing? Put me down. She said as she half-heartedly fraught against him. HHM no, I think I like you better like this. He said as he threw her over his shoulder in a fireman carry hold. I'm going to skin you alive. Just you wait. The cold hair of the night seemed to have sobered up you in quite nice. You damn pervert. She growled at him as she felt a hand fondling her ass. Trying to save face June. The nose, nose and because of that I know this is turning you on. June let out a growl but didn't say anything. She couldn't deny the fact that Naruto pushing her buttons and challenging her excited her, as it allowed her to be dominated, but without having to actually be weak. That she could be her usual tough self and Naruto would just up his game to match her succeed, that screwing her endlessly again and again, without clinging to her like a leech or falling in love after some meaningless sex. But could she really make this decision with her heart and not her head? Resting her head against his chest and listening to his heartbeat June, decided that maybe it was time to give Naruto an answer to the offer he brought up a few days ago. The Dai Li and Lake Lagai found themselves pinned against the wall by the very stone hands they attempted to use on the intruder, while protecting their master Long Feng, who sported suspiciously villainous mustache and long pointy beard. You are Long Feng, are you not? Nai asked as the man narrowed his eyes. I am he. I must say I don't believe I've ever heard of someone of your description. Not many people have. Don't bother try signaling for the rest of your soldiers. They're being preoccupied by my associates. To cut straight to the point we are here to offer an alliance. This would be in your best interests as it only took three out of the seven to demolish your forces, one that will solidify you as king of the earth nation, if you play your cards right. Go on. Long Feng urged the red hat on. Long Feng wasn't a fool, he watched his elite soldiers be defeated with abilities that weren't conceivably possible. Only the Avatar was known in this world as the only being capable of bending all four elements, but whoever these people are could do things even the Avatar wasn't capable of. Taking over people's bodies, wielding lightning like that acted like an extension. 
A part of their will and spirits only know what else if this was the power of three out of the seven mysterious infiltrators. The or to surrender your forces, intel, and anything else you have to one Naruto Uzumaki and Princess Azula. Failure to comply will result in us wreaking havoc and a very chatty blonde informing the Earth King and leaving you to his judgment. Long Feng scowled, the one thing that the Earth Kingdom couldn't say they were better in the Fire Nation was at then it was their execution of those charged with treason. Whether it was being burned to death or being stoned to death, they were both painful and horrible ways to die. Though the former was quicker and less drawn out, not to mention they didn't leave those charged to die from their internal injuries. But if we somehow manage to get his hands on these warriors and break them in, make them into his soldiers, then no one would ever dare oppose him. You have a deal. You three are definitely killers in green. He commented. Mai on the other hand scoffed at the comment and looked the other way. Tai Lee grinned at the compliment while Azula just smirked. Things were going easier than thought. Especially since the Kayashi warrior leader was carrying on her a special invite, which would let them join among the Earth King's royal guests. Sensei, remind me again why we're going with the dress-up option again. Mai exasperatedly asked as her she did her best not to twitch, the white face paint adorning her face, bringing out a want to scratch her face. Mai was not one for makeup or other such things. Because, my chan while I'm working the angle with Long Feng, I think it would be best if you three, under the guise of the Kayashi warriors, get close to the Earth King. After all, if this mysterious blonde stranger shows up and becomes good buddies with the Earth King, word is going to travel fast. Next thing you know, we have to deal with the Avatar and friends, followed by possible mass panic and stuff like that. But wouldn't the Avatar and his followers come rushing to see us if they think we're their allies? Azula wondered, curious about what answer Naruto had for this. The Avatar and friends are still looking for the bison and seeking counsel with the Earth King, who is still being given the lead around by Long Feng. If they do decide to visit then they have a nasty surprise of having to deal with you three. Either way, I'm more than sure that at the end of the day things will still be in our favor. Oh. Oh. I got a question. The bundle of energy that was Tai Lee frantically waved her arm in the air. Yes Tai Lee. He called upon the leaping girl before she tired herself out. Then again she could probably go about hopping for a while now. Why don't you use your Gain Jutsu thing to disguise your hair and eyes and get close to the Earth King? The Gain Jutsu I use are for more specialized purposes, and the kind you're suggesting requires a level of control that even I lack. Gain Jutsu has always been my weak point when it comes to shinobi arts. Not to mention Gain Jutsu effectiveness is disrupting chakra, so there's no telling the effects if I use it on someone for an extended period of time. No good if I unintentionally cost brain damage to someone I didn't mean to intend to. Azula and Mai knew Naruto was pulling his explanation out of his ass, but since he knew more about Chakra than they did, and the fact that if he wanted to I win illusion things he probably would have, so they let it go. Especially if that meant he had more time to shamelessly flirt with them. Tai Lee though lapped up the information like a sponge. Wow I knew there was a reason. So why don't you just use a... Huh? What was that? Naruto said as he turned off to the side. I think Sho's contacting me. Got to go. Naruto commented as he shoeshined away before Tai Lee could bring up another logical question. Elsewhere within Ba Sing Si the gang was making posters for Appa. They knew if they pressed on with their efforts they might find trouble, so they needed to find Appa as soon as possible, so they would be able to mistake. Katara held up a poster which was her rendition which was pretty accurate. Hey, I thought designing the lost Appa poster was my job. I've worked all day on my Appa. Sokka remarked as he held up a crude drawing of the air bison with a proud smile. Sokka, the arrow is on Appa's head. The perplexed avatar pointed out as Katara struggled to contain her laughter. This is his head. Sokka countered as he pointed at the poster. Katara took a hold of the poster and studied it up close. Why are feet coming out of it? She said as she turned every which way. Indignant, Sokka snatched the sketch from Katara's hands. Those are his horns. Sokka hung his head. I haven't seen him a while okay. Off, though decided to mess with Sokka incongruously stated. It looks just like him to me. Flattered, Sokka proudly responded. Thank you, I worked really in the middle of his statement, as if he remembered Toph was blind he asked her. Why do you feel the need to do that? He asked as a smirk formed on Toph's face. Let's just stick with the professional version. Katara noted. But that said everyone began gather up the posters when a rapping on the front door garnered their attention. Ong eagerly pops up. Wow, you're right. Patience really pays off. Ong said in response to Katara's earlier statement about patience and rushes to open the door. Judy. Ong said in surprise. This was the first Judy they had met when they arrived in Ba Sing Si. Hello, Ong and Katara and Sokka and Toph. She greeted them with her usual eerie grin and careful speech. The others gathered around to talk to her. 
though, apparently Ju Di's attempt to give them the usual runabout was not going to happen today. As a result she soon found herself brought in front of Long Feng. I am very disappointed in your work with the Avatar and his friends, Ju Di. I had hoped that you would be able to control the situation. Long Feng calmly remarked as distress formed on Ju Di's face. I'm so sorry, but they don't trust me anymore. I don't think I can keep working like this. Terribly upset she covered her mouth. Yu Di, the Earth King has invited you to Long Feng softly stated only for Naruto to appear into the room. Hum now you didn't expect one woman to give the run around to a small group of suspicious and emotional teenagers. He said as he walked around the dark hair and yellowish brown woman. She had long flowing raven hair reminiscent of June's long mane. And what do you suggest? Long Feng always kept his guard around Naruto. The fact that the others in Lake Lagai followed his orders obviously gave away his status as leader. Control the leader and you control the troops. I heard that a few days ago you managed to get your hands on a freedom fighter. Let's just say I heard from a friend who heard from the direct source, a member of the Avatars group had an encounter with a freedom fighter that matches the description of the one you caught. All you have to do is have that boy mention he might know where the Avatars bison is and lead them here. I'm more than capable of handling the Avatar on my own, so there isn't much to worry about. Very well as long as everything is handled quietly. Meanwhile at a tiny tea shop where Iroh was working had becoming popular. Inside Iroh is pouring tea for a wealthy dressed man and his bodyguards. This man was Quan, a merchant who started several businesses which included the first trans wall food delivery service. This allowed the middle and upper ring customers to acquire their favorite lower ring delicacies without having to travel into the dangerous sections of the lower ring themselves. So you're the genius behind this incredible brew. The whole city is buzzing about you. Quan holds up a teacup and a hand glittering with jeweled rings, I hope Pao pays you well. The tea is its own reward. A smiling Ira responded. But it doesn't have to be the only reward. How would you like to have your own tea shop? Stunned, a near breathless Ira managed to say in a daze. My own tea shop this is a dream come true. Ao scampers to join the conversation. What's going on here are you trying to poach my tea maker? He demanded as he threw himself protectively between Iroh and Quan. Sorry pal, that's business for you, am I right? Ao, the owner of the tea shop grew increasingly desperate. Mushy, if you stay I will make you assistant manager. Wait senior assistant manager. I'll give you a new apartment in the upper ring. The tea shop is yours to do whatever you want. Zuko glances over from bussing a table. Complete creative freedom. I even get to name the shop. An elated Iroh asked, feeling that this was too good to be true. Of course. A senior executive assistant manager. Pao pleading to Iroh, knowing if he lost the old man he would lose the secret weapon that was the result of his tea shop's growing popularity. Iroh sets the teapot into the hands of shop owner Pao, who grimaces in pain. Pao walks off as Iroh and Quan exchange respectful bows. Zuko crosses in the foreground, pausing as Iroh speaks to him. Filled with excitement Iroh told Zuko the good news. Did you hear nephew? This man wants to give us our own tea shop in the upper ring of the city. That's right young man. Your life is about to change for the better. Zuko continues to walk away towards the front door, setting down the tray of cups. I'll try to contain my joy. He gravely countered as he stepped outside. Some time later at the cramped apartment complex where Zuko and Iroh lived at. So, I was thinking about names for my new tea shop. How about the Jasmine Dragon it's dramatic, poetic, has a nice ring to it. The avatars here in Ba Sing Si. He holds out of the leaflet. And he's lost his bison. Iroh takes the leaflet. We have a chance for a new life here. Zuko walks to stare out a window. If you start stirring up trouble, we could lose all the good things that are happening for us. Zuko spins around to face Iroh, clearly irate. Good things that are happening for you. Have you ever thought that I want more from life than a nice apartment and a job serving tea? Earnestly Iroh countered Zuko's question. There is nothing wrong with a life of peace and prosperity. I suggest you think about what it is that you want for your life and why. Zuko turns to look outside again. I want my destiny. What that means is up to you. Zuko walks away from the window. The tea weevil. Iroh shakes his head in disgust at the name he brought up. No, that's stupid. Sure enough the gang ran into Jet. And thankfully enough the gong did not question why the Dai Li or the city's police force didn't show up to break up this disturbance, which was mainly Katara wrecking some against Jet who was on the defensive. Though for Jet's sake Toss' ability to feel breathing and heartbeats assured them he was being truthful about meaning them no harm and knowing where Apple was. And sure enough when Toph discovered a handful of white fur, this convinced them they were on the right track. And when Jet's gang showed up and mentioned the Dai Li and Rejog Jet's memory, they put the clues together and made way to Lake Lagai. And of course things got creepier when they found a room of duties. Which was none other than a bunch of obviously brainwashed women. 
Eventually the group entered into a massive cavern. The group cautiously enters, and the stone door abruptly slides shut behind them. They spin around in surprise, as the room was plunged into darkness, then green lanterns flare to life, illuminating the vast cave. Only now do they notice the Dai Li high above them, suspended from chains or clinging to the ceiling itself. Ahead, Long Feng waits with several more Dai Li. You have made yourselves enemies of the state. He grimly stated. And quite predictable sadly enough. Naruto added as he came into sight. Ong's eyes widened. Naruto. He cried out in shock as he pointed at Naruto. At this rate it looks like you guys have gotten by more by luck than planning. Naruto set and sought off and grinned. Toph couldn't help but notice you wrecking hell. Shame I didn't find you first. You would have been able to whip these lazy sacks into shape. He complimented. Well the Dai Li as they are now would have given even Toph a bit of a trouble, she knew that one on one and one on maybe two or three she would come out on top. I should have known you that being involved in this sort of thing. Where's Appa? Ong demanded while the blonde just shrugged. Right now you should be worried about your situation. I was hoping you would take all the chances I've been giving you to grow on. That you would work past your own feelings to do what was right for the people of this world. So many people believe in your destiny as the Avatar, and despite my own reservations, I wanted to see what they saw in you. There was also the unspoken reasons that Naruto was leaving out. Like how much of himself he saw in Ong, from his youthful and naive optimism to his selfish and one-track ways. If Ong was going to walk the path he used to walk, then Naruto would gladly play the role of Itachi, and anyone else he had too, in order to help Ong reach his full potential. I'll tell you what Ong I'm in a generous mood so I'll offer you deal. Give up trying to contact the Earth King, and we'll let you go on your way to find Appa, and you all can't leave Ba Sing Si without so much as a fuss. He said as Ong was momentarily stunned by the offer. That's outrageous. Long Feng cried out, obviously not on whatever Naruto was planning. My plans of course are not mutually exclusive to your whims, and believing so was of your short-sightedness. After Naruto's down dressing of Long Feng, he gave out a disappointed sigh. Unfortunately it had the effect of proving something I hoped wouldn't be true. The fact you were placed finding Appa, something personal to you over the many potential lives of the Earth Kingdom and duty, shows you aren't ready to fulfill your destiny. One or the other Ong you have to make the choice. Ong paused as Naruto's piercing assessment caused him to doubt himself for a moment. You once told me that you only fail once you give up. I won't give up not on Appa or the people of the world. I'll find a way to save both of them. And you think you'll be able to find the strength to do so? Naruto continued the verbal jabs. I have to. It's my destiny. I have to bring balance to the world, and I won't let you stand in my way. Ong said as he moved into a fighting stance. The Fire Nation cannot and will not win this war or the people of this world will continue to suffer. Why can't you see that? I see more clearly than you can ever know Ong. I know the people are suffering, do not think I'm not also striving to bring peace to this world, bring torn apart by war. I do not support the campaign of the Fire Lord and the nation's supremacy ideals. The only thing I do in the name of the Fire Nation is to keep Azula and others who herald from there that are precious to me safe. Why can't you see that you're outmatched? Naruto asked as he held up his hands. Crystallizing one arm and the being placed on the wall next to it. I have access to elements that isn't even conceivable in this world. And with that the wall exploded. And I told you once before I am not allied with the Fire Nation. My allegiance is to Azula and my precious people, no one else. But Azula is with the Fire Nation. If you're helping her then doesn't that mean you're also helping them? Don't you see you're doing what the Fire Lord wants? You said you don't agree with their actions, but you didn't try to stop the tank. You haven't done anything to stop them and prove your statements. Ong tried to reason as Naruto chuckled. Let's just say Azula and I have our own ideals that are different from the Fire Lord's ambition. Naruto cryptically answered and noticed the confusion of the gong. Long Feng had grown impatient of the encompassing debate between Naruto and Ong. Enough with this talk. Cease Long Feng was cut off as Naruto threw his hand back and began forming a Rasengan. Remember your place. Naruto cut him off with a tone devoid of emotion which was enough to make everyone present uncomfortable. The Dai Li agents were about to move to defend their master, when a ball of sand materialized in the middle of the room about the size of a bear, as to remind them that if they made a false move their careers as agents would come to an end. His attention turned back to the gong who looked like they were about to act. Naruto began to wonder if maybe Ong needed to be pushed more. You've never experienced the pain of lost in person have you? You've never had to see anyone you truly care for vanish before your eyes. Maybe if you saw that then you would understand. He mumbled as he looked at his closed fist. Maybe you would understand the essence of pain. He whispered as the images of nearly everyone he knew began flashing through his mind. The essence of sacrifice maybe then you would understand. He would need one more push, but now was not the time. If you can survive the Dai Li I hope to see some growth from you. 
With that final statement the Dai Li jumped into action. The Dai Li encircled the group. Two agents launch a stone fist attack, but Toph disintegrates them in mid-flight. As the dust clears, she launches them across the room with a pair of rock pillars. My offer still stands Toph. Naruto said as she sent a weak tremor in his direction which he easily avoided. And by the way I really enjoyed last night who would have known that the gruff earth bender could be so soft. Naruto whispered as they continued to fight. Behind them, Jet turns and rushes another pair, cutting their stone fist projectiles from the air. Sliding along the ground past the first, he trips the second with his hook sword, slamming him hard to the ground. You weren't so bad yourself, but I can't abandon my friends. Then at least be careful because I was keeping tabs on your group and I overheard two gentlemen were asking about you. He said as he went about describing their descriptions. Shin Fu and you. Toph spoke with a growl. Old acquaintances? Must have been my parents I can't believe they would on second thought. She amended the statement upon remembering what her parents were like. Apparently they have a metal cage waiting for you if you're insistent on staying with this group, then be careful. Though I'm curious as to how you even met up with them. Well the reason I joined them was because I wanted my freedom. I secretly followed the others and volunteered myself as Twinkle Toes Earthbending Instructor. They weren't even aware I ran away at the time. Then when I leave Ba Sing Si you'll have your answer then won't you? I'll have my answer then. She answered him with a nod as they sought out new dance partners. Naruto switched with the Dai Li agents and took on Ong. Long Fang watches dispassionately as Naruto dodged and ducked the avatar's strikes. Katara and Sokka managed to destroy two of the glove projectiles the Dai Li sent at them before being seized by two more. Toph intervenes with a stone wall before they can be drugged to the waiting Dai Li. They send a rush of stone towards Toph, but she raises high into the cavern on a pillar of rock, forcing them to pursue her the same way. Do more Dai Li race up the walls to either side of her to strike out at Toph with horizontal columns of stone. High in the cavern, Toph swats aside the first two agents and then leaps to avoid the two columns as they crash together beneath her. Landing atop them, she bends up a pair of stone blocks from the columns, using them to drive away both of the remaining agents simultaneously. A fist of stone grabs the back of her shirt and she is hauled through the air toward a waiting Dai Li. Jet intervenes at the last moment. Leaping past he hooks her belt with his sword, pulling her to safety as the agent kicks a stone foot attack after them. Longshot covers them as they land, intercepting the missile with one of his arrows. Joined by two of his brethren, the Dai Li retaliate with three fist attacks at Longshot, but Jet cuts them from the air with a whirlwind of slashes. Meanwhile Long Feng has seen enough. He flees from the room, sealing a stone door behind him. Back at the battle, Ong lands and blows two Dai Li aside with a burst of air. Long Feng is escaping. Ong and Jet break free from the melee to pursue him, but were prevented from going far by Naruto. With a kunai drawn he shoved it into Jet's body much to Ong's horror. Jet. Ong cried out as Naruto spun and his arm which collided with Jet's skull. For Jet everything went wide as a tableau of images from his past flood his mind. The first image was Smellerby, a young tomboyish freedom fighter with a large mane of hair and rather small stature gave her the appearance of a boy. She brandishing two swords in front of a tent, a dagger clenched in her teeth. The duke and pipsqueak, two more were also standing together. The former young snot-nosed boy and the latter rather large muscular young man. More scenes fill Jet's mind of him standing against a shy Katara. Cheers of the freedom fighters as they feast in the tree fortress. Standing with Smellerby and Longshot aboard the ferry. Sitting and speaking with Iroh and Zuko on the ferry deck. Handing food out to the passengers. Being dragged away by the Dai Li and the brainwashing beneath the lake. Faces flashed by rapidly, Iroh, Colonel Monkey, Long Feng, his own at various ages. Jet slowly dropped, overcome by the thoughts racing through his brain. Jet. Jet. Sorry Angra, but I need Long Feng for one more thing. Naruto said as a shaking Ong glared up at him. How could how could you be so heartless? The boy won't die if you get him medical treatment. If you manage to get by the Dai Li I'll be seeing you again. Naruto remarked as he followed out the same direction Long Feng did. The Dai Li agents were soon dispatched as all the others rushed over to the stricken jet, wearing sorrowful and shocked expressions. Batara draws forth her bending water, kneels beside him, and applies her healing powers to his chest. He's going to live, but he won't be fighting for a while. Katara informed the group. You guys go find Appa. We'll take care of Jet. Smellerby urged them. We're not going to leave you. Seeing Jet lying there, hurt, Katara could feel herself letting go of the grudge she had for Jet. The betrayal that stained her heart and the lies that made her feel foolish. There's no time. Just go. We'll take care of him. He's our leader. The gong looked at Longshot with expressions of wonder as this was the first time they ever heard him spoke. Tenderly Jet reached out and clasped Katara's hand. Don't worry Katara, I'll be fine. He assured her as he smiled weakly up at her. 
She closes her eyes and sighs before rising to her feet. The heroes file off somberly, leaving the freedom fighters behind with Toph and Sokka bringing up the rear. The gong arrive to a room where six manacles lie empty within the cell. App is gone. Long Feng beat us here. Ong shouted in grief and punched a wall. If we keep moving, maybe we can catch up to him. Sokka assured them as they continued on. An outcropping of rock bearing a circular stone plug arises at the edge of the lake. Cracks form on the plug, and it shoots off to shatter on the nearby cliff face. The gong emerge and start racing along the narrow shoreline. Glancing over his shoulder, Ong sees nine Dai Li emerge in pursuit from the hole behind them. Do you think we can outrun them? Sokka asked as he ran up beside Ong. I don't think it's gonna matter. The avatar remarked as he saw they would be facing more resistance up ahead. Six more Dai Li were flanking the waiting Long Feng. The six agents bend up a 30-foot wall of stone beneath Long Feng's feet, sealing the strip of land between the cliff side and the lake. The gong draw to a stop, and behind them the Dai Li raise up another wall, boxing them in. They are enclosed and surrounded by 18 Dai Li, who cling to the edges of the walls and the cliff side, while Long Feng watches from atop the first wall. Momo sweeps down out of the sky and lands on Ong's shoulder chattering excitedly. What is it Momo? Momo launches up past Long Feng to disappear into the bright midday sun. Moments later Appa emerges from the dazzling light, hurtling downwards towards them. The four heroes look upwards with expressions of delight. Appa. Ong shouted in delight. Appa swoops down and smashes through the first wall, continuing on through the second. The Dai Li perched on the wall are soon knocked senseless by the bursting walls and fall to the ground or spill into the water. Ong and Toph bend the cliff that the remaining agents are perched on, flinging them far out into the lake. Appa circles around to land heavily near the shaken Long Feng as the remaining Dai Li flee. Turning from his fleeing men, Long Feng faces an enraged Appa. I can handle you by myself. He launches a kick at Appa, who catches his leg in his teeth. With a mighty toss of his powerful neck, Appa sends him skipping far out across Lake Lagai to disappear with a final splash. The sky bison pauses momentarily before spitting out his shoe. Ong, Sokka, Katara and Momo throw themselves upon the shaggy bison, while Toph strokes his nose. Yay. Appa. Sokka shouted as he rubbed the air bison's leg. Ong pressed his head into Appa's fur as he began to cry. I missed you, buddy. Appa's great brown eyes close in contentment. Though with every story there was another side. Hours ago, prior to Appa's escape. Prince Zuko. I was wondering where you would appear. Sho remarked as he stepped out of the shadows of his illusions. Surprised, Zuko removed the mask of the blue spirit. How did you manage to track me? And how did you know it was me? Hum now, have you forgotten already? At this rate you're going to burn yourself out. No pun attended. The days of summer had just begun. As per usual Oz I was too busy to spend quality time with his children, so they were brought to the summer home by Lee, Lo, and Naruto. I don't have much of a choice. I need to get stronger. Zuko growled. He was trying to make his fire stronger, but to no avail. Naruto mentally cursed Ozai for his negligence. There was only one reason why Zuko would be working himself to the bone to improve his firebending. Have you ever thought that firebending might not be your strong point? He was confused by that. What are you talking about? He asked, wanting an explanation. I mean just because you're born a firebender doesn't mean it's your only talent. Takey trailed off, he was about to mention how Azula seemed to be a natural at picking up the Tejustu forms he was showing her, but considering how inferior he felt at times, that might not be the best comparison. My. He finally concluded at the momentary pause. I've taken to teach her about using different shinobi tools and weapon. Her accuracy is rather frightening. Not in the sense of most young prodigies in the elemental nations if you were talking about age, but the time she was adapting to using them definitely put her in the same category of a genius. So I should try weapons. Zuko pondered, though he was far from convinced. I don't see why not. Weapons are useless not only as tools when you wouldn't be able to bend, but it's a skill you'll always have access to provided that weapons are nearby. You could use poles, staffs, or even swords. Just give it a thought Prince Zuko I'm sure you'll find the answer. With a talk finished Naruto began his journey along the beach front. It was by Naruto's helpful suggestion that Zuko took his first step in learning swordsmanship. How much longer are you going to be hiding in the shadows Iro? Uncle. What are you doing here? A shocked Zuko asked the firebending master. For now Iro ignored Zuko as he kept his focus on Naruto. It appears we've played right into your hands. Hum now Iro, you make it sound like I'm evil or something when you say that. All I'm trying to do is see to it that this endless cycle people are trapped in is undone. The Avatar is the one destined to bring balance to the worlds. By standing against him you are only fueling the fire that leads to this imbalance that threatens the world. Iroh argued. 
Azula is loyal to her father, and assisting her only helps the Fire Nation's campaign. It's funny really, and where was her uncle or her mother to make sure she didn't steep too far into the darkness if Oz's eyes issues were so apparent. He asked as a look of guilt flashed across Iroh's face. I'm not blind to the darkness in Azula that much is apparent, but I'll be damned to sit back and say she's a lost cause because of something like her heritage. The treat her like she's some monster in human skin. After all I inherited the will of the one known as the failure, yet I strive and become something greater than that. To abandon Azula without a fight because that is what destiny decides is not something I can stomach. He paused, taking a moment to compose himself. Iroh, you put your faith in a kid who was told of his destiny years too soon. He is uncertain and soft. He is a human being, a flawed individual heralded as a god is the problem solver to the people's problems. How will these people ever grow and learn to fend for themselves if they place all their burdens and hope in one person? After all he couldn't have done it alone. No matter how strong he got when he tried to do things on his own he failed. He needed them, the others. He needed Shinobi's help against the Juubi. He also couldn't have sealed Kagaya without Sasuke. The hopes of the entire human race was simply a burden far too large for one person, especially considering that balance never seemed attainable with the fact the avatar kept coming back. He then pulled out the key from his sleeve as he made his way over to the bound Appa, all the while continuing to speak. Zuko, forgive me for not being able to help you more, but I ask if you were to ever listen to me then let now be this time. You can't honestly respect a man who would outright physically harm you, his own son. Such blind loyalty is foolish, especially to those who don't deserve such loyalty. Oz I is on a campaign to fuel his own ego and inferiority complex. I may be an outsider looking into a family's dysfunction, but I've dealt with people enough to know darkness when I see it. You may think your father can restore your honor, but true honor is not something he can take. Only you, Zuko, not the prince, not the blue spirit, and definitely not Oz I's son can give you your honor, but you, only you, once you find yourself can reclaim your honor. Seeing your determination and obsession you remind me of my old student. He was willing to do anything at the cost of others if it meant fulfilling his ambition. Is that what you really want to do? Live your life serving someone whose only use for you is a means to improve his own self-image. Naruto then raised his hand to the ceiling, and with it released a pulse of gravity that instantly destroyed the concrete ceiling, and looked at a confused Appa whose limbs he had just freed with the key. Go. Naruto commanded and without a moment's hesitation, Appa took off into the gaping hole in the ceiling, and Naruto looked back at Zuko. You have to think hard about this Zuko. What is more important to you? False honor by a man who would scar his own child, or choosing your own destiny and becoming a man, the man capable of rebuilding his family and helping his once great nation reclaim its former glory. A powerful gust of wind erupted from nigh, temporarily blinding Zuko's and Iroh's vision while he disappeared. After that, the place cleared leaving only the two fugitives behind. As the gong retreated towards the palace they knew they were going to have to get to the king. They knew if Naruto managed to get his hands on the Earth King it would be all over. There was no way they were going to be able to invade the Fire Nation without the Earth Kingdom's support. They maneuvered around the palace defenses the gang found themselves rushing into a vast chamber lined with ornate pillars and lit by hanging lanterns. The draw to a stop before a large dais, weapons at the ready. Seated upon a golden throne is the Earth King himself. He is a bespectacled young man wearing a simple crown and necklace of jade beads. And to their shock Long Feng was being led away, hurling accusations and the word traitor at a docile-looking Naruto. So what took you guys so long? Naruto asked as he turned around to greet the gang. Earth King. Watch out. You're in danger. That guy is with the enemy. Sokka cried out as he pointed at Naruto. You invade my palace, lay waste to all my guards, break down my fancy door, and you expect me to trust you? The aggravated Earth King demanded as throughout the statement his voice rose. He has a good point. Toph sardonically added. But but. Sokka stammered as Naruto folded his arms and grinned. No, we're on your side we're here to help. If you're on my side, then drop your weapons and stand down. He ordered the reluctant group. You heard his majesty water boy. Drop the weapons. He said as Sokka growled and reluctantly dropped his weapon. One by one, the group dropped their weapons to the floor. See, we're friends, your earthiness. Ong attempted to charm the earth king as he kept his eyes locked on Naruto. You know Ong if you keep looking at me so intently I think Katara might start to get jealous. He taunted as said teens began to flush furiously. Your Majesty my name is Ong, I'm the Avatar, and I can tell you that, that guy he pointed at Naruto. Is not on your side. You mean the guy that informed me that Long Feng has been lying to me for years, kept the war from me, has been using the Dai Li for his own means, and whose associates are currently freeing and undoing all the mental and emotional damage of all the young women who had mysteriously disappeared over the years. The gong sufficed to say we're dumbfounded. The king, unimpressed, continues to frown grimly. 
With a wave of his arm he was about to signal the Dai Li to attack, but Naruto spoke up. Your majesty they are merely youths. At that age many of us are anxious you know. I haven't had the most peaceful history with the Avatar and his friends, so their reaction to me is understandable. Peaceful? Your majesty he's working with Azula, the princess of the Fire Nation. He helped her dry to break into Ba Sing Si with a drill. Ong accused the blonde who stroked his chin. Boom um, no I don't remember doing that. Think I would remember help trying to break through Ba Sing Si's wall. Dot, Naruto said as he scratched the head of the king's bear, Bosco. You? You're Toph Bay Frong are you not? The Earth King asked the blind bender who stepped forward and bowed her head. Yes, your highness. Toph respectfully answered to the surprise of the other members of the gang. While Toph may have been brash and a bit on the wild side, she still had pride in her nation, and she was still an Earth Kingdom citizen. I heard you can detect when people are lying. Maybe you can verify your companion's claims, if they happen to be true. He asked her. Because of Kuei's naivety the thought that she might lie to him never came to mind, especially as a result of Lefeng's pandering and assurance of his citizens' utmost loyalty in him. Well I can tell you one thing. In no way, shape or form was I actively attempting or attempted to destroy or help to destroy the wall of Ba Sing Si. I'm pretty sure I was ogling a rather cute triple-jointed circus performer at the time. He answered with a cheeky grin. I don't even need my detection ability to tell you he's being truthful. Toph dead panned and narrowed her eyes at Naruto, or at least in his general direction. Ong and Sokka couldn't believe what they were hearing. Even if what Naruto was saying was true they didn't think Toph would verify it. While neither of them would have particularly liked lying to the leader of one of the nations they figured in just this one instance it would have been okay. It would have been good for the world. As you can see Earth King I've been truthful the moment I've been here. The Fire Nation is being led by a madman, and only with the help of your great nation can we put this to an end. Naruto continued in an overly patriotic tone more in tone to an actor. As he told you that the Fire Nation will be weak during a solar eclipse, and the Firebenders would be helpless then. Sokka hastily added. Indeed he has. The Earth Kingdom countered as Sokka deflated. Oh. Sokka deflated as the shock of this information prevented him from coming up with anything else to counter. Your Majesty what they failed to tell you is that Princess Azula is already aware of this, and they will respond accordingly. Moving your troops out of Ba Sing Si on that day will leave you vulnerable to a counter-attack. It shows their naivety and lack of war experience that they think the enemy would do nothing with the information they had gathered. He should know. He was there, in fact he helped her found out. Is this true? The Earth King tentatively asked Naruto as a look of concern formed on the monarch's face. Your Majesty let me explain myself. Weeks ago I was just a traveler who after some very traumatic incidents, wandered around in a daze. It was in a deserted town where I found that group doing what I believe was accosting the young princess. For a time I was hired as a bodyguard of sorts during my short tenure in the Fire Nation. Regardless of what nation a person is problem it is in my nature to give them a chance before labeling them as good or evil. Now an outsider who has managed to avoid most of the events of the war would of course side with whatever side manages to first tell their sympathetic story. Despite the others involved I reacted on instinct which made he choose to hear her side of the story first because of past experiences. Only later on while I continued to travel with her that I was able to start putting the pieces together. You're not going to believe him are you? Sokka cried out as the Earth King paused to think about it for a few moments. His story isn't unreasonable. He was a traveling young man helping what he believed was a young woman in trouble. Could he truly be blamed for being ignorant in something he had no way of knowing? Ong, Sokka, and Katara's hope continued to drop. It was obvious the Earth King was sympathizing with the blonde. Even if there were to try and argue that Naruto met them previously and knew Ong was the avatar, the blonde would most likely have a counter-argument for that as well. I am not sold on attacking on the day of the Black Sun, as I have to think about what's best for my people, but until then you have my full support otherwise. The gang minus Toph while happy knew that Naruto was up to something. But then considering his earlier words and his current actions, it seemed like he wanted the Fire Nation to lose. What would have stopped him from attacking and capturing them underground earlier? Could it be that he had plans to overthrow Oz Ai and become the new Fire Lord? It was a bit of a nasty trade-off one genocidal maniac for a very crafty charismatic and rather powerful one. Then again this world had been wrought with war for a century and they couldn't deny the people the peace they sought. That and they were sure once Ong fully mastered the four elements that he would stand a chance against Naruto if he ended up replacing Azai. Either way, they knew that time was running out and their only hope at ending the war was the eclipse. They needed to defeat the Fire Nation before Sazen's comment showed up and powered up the firebenders. Your Majesty it looks like my work is done here. I'd hope to see you tomorrow about that thing we discussed. He said as he bowed and began walking down the hall, acknowledging Toph with a subtle toe-tap as he left the chambers. Toph nodded her head slightly. 
I really hope you know what you're doing. A few minutes later an Earth Nation citizen in robes and battle armor entered the room. Your Majesty. I apologize for the interruption. He walks up next to the heroes, at the base of the dais, and drops to his hands and knees. This is General Howe. He's the leader of the Council of Five and my highest ranking generals. The Earth King introduced the man who was wearing the nation's green and yellow colors with a thick bushy beard. Lifting his forehead from the floor the man spoke. We searched Long Feng's office. I think we found something that will interest everybody. But that Toph was given a scroll that informed her that her mother was in the city. It was none other than obviously a trap by those two. Ong was given one about a mysterious man asking him to meet him at the Air Temple and the Water Tribe siblings some information about their father. With that the game decided for now they would split up. Ong to master the Avatar state, Sokka to meet off with his and Katara's father and Katara to aid the Earth King, while Toph went to meet with her mom. Your Majesty. There are three female warriors here to see you, they're from the island of Kaiashi. The guard informed the Earth King who was bidding farewell to Ong and Sokka. Atsuki. A rather shocked Sokka stated while freezing during his attempt to climb Appa's side, resulting in him slipping and falling to the stone plaza, sits up and begins rubbing his sore back. You know these warriors? The Earth King asked, surprised. Sokka rose and began speaking confidently. Oh yeah the Kayashi warriors are a skilled group of fighters, he praised them. And trustworthy too. They're good friends of ours. Satisfied with the answer the Earth King decided that they would be welcomed as honored guests. Some time had passed as the troops were assembled and the preparations were underway to warmly welcome the Kayashi warriors. In our hour of need, it is with the highest honor that I welcome our esteemed allies, the Kayashi warriors. The Earth King formally introduced them. We are the Earth King's humble servants. Azula stated, her voice and eyes steady, everything was going according to plan. Look Bosco, the Kayashi warriors are here to protect us. Aren't you excited? The Earth King asked as he playfully tugged at Bosco's cheeks. Though after the exciting day the animal merely yawned and lay down on the ground. The Earth King then turned serious upon addressing the Kayashi warriors. It's been a difficult week for me. My most trusted advisor, Long Feng, and his Dai Li agents tried to take control of Ba Sing Si from me. It's terrible when you can't trust the people who are closest to you. Azula smoothly remarked as she kept her eyes from straying to Naruto who was standing silently by the Earth King's side. The Earth King continued while stroking Bosco's head. But there is good news as we speak, the Council of Five is meeting to discuss a possible invasion of the Fire Nation this summer on the day of a solar eclipse. Feigning enthusiasm Azula continued. Really? Now that sounds like a fascinating and brilliant plan. Your Majesty with your permission I would like to enlist the aid of the Kayashi warriors against the plot to assassinate you. Naruto spoke up causing the Earth King to recoil in shock. The day had passed since Naruto brought up the assassination attempt and had curried favor with the Earth King. Meanwhile the foxy trio was waiting for the blonde to show up and give them news on how the plan was going along. Sorry to keep you girls waiting. Naruto said as he entered the room. The girls noticeably perked upon seeing the blonde. Naruto. With a running start Tai Li took to the air and landed into the blonde's arms. Her arms wrapped around his neck as she affectionately rubbed her cheek against his. Now I missed you too. He said as he kissed her forehead. But if you keep this up I might end up trying to get you out of those clothes. He whispered as Tai Li went red and squeaked as she hopped off. So what are you planning? Why did you tell the Earth King about an assassination attempt to be aware of? Whatever Naruto had planned he seemed to have only let them in on part of the plan. The next part of us gaining his trust and willingness to hand over his kingdom. He answered the disbelieving Mai's question with one of his own. And how do you plan on doing that? This is where Azula comes in and Long Feng serves his real purpose. It's time we weed out the traitors. He said as he motioned them all over and began informing them the next stage of the plan. A pair of Dai Li silently slid down the back of the two closest pillars of the room so they could listen what was being in vapid detail discussed. Once the discussion was over the Dai Li retreated back up the pillars. What is this about? Azula asked in outrage as she soon found herself being dragged to Ba Sing Si's dungeon area. Your agents show up in the middle of the night and drag me down here. You will not treat a Kayashi warrior this way. She struggled against her captors. But you are not a Kayashi warrior, are you? Long Fang sinisterly asked as he rose from his bench. Princess Azula of the Fire Nation. What do you want? She asked as she stopped struggling. I want to make a deal. It's time that I regain control of Ba Sing Si. And you have something I need. Oh? She reacted in interest. The Earth King's trust. He confidently stated. Why should I help you? She asked a bit wearily. Because I can get you the Avatar. And why should I trust you? My partner has more power and potential output for resources. She remarked as she folded her arms. Your partner is a backstabber. We made a deal and he betrayed me the first chance he got. 
What makes you think he won't do the same thing to you? Azula paused, as if she was contemplating Long Feng's words. In fact he's already informed the Earth King about the solar eclipse. He's playing you for a fool princess and clings to whoever seems to promise him the most filling, like a parasite. What do you suggest then? We eliminate him like we would a parasite. Okay, you struck my curiosity. Go on. Azula replied with a wicked smile. Naruto had played his part and now it was Azula's part to continue on with what he started with. For now it was Azula's turn to show off her craftiness. Inside the Jasmine Dragon, Zuko is sweeping up for the evening. He had just gotten over some akin to a fever dream and it looked like he was finally going to let things go. As Iroh clears a table, a man enters and walks up to him. A message from the royal palace. The messenger informed Iroh as he bowed and handed a scroll to him. Iroh reads the scroll with a look of worry before his eyes widen with astonishment. I, I can't believe it. He said, overcame at the news. What is it uncle? Zuko asked as he walked over. Great news. We've been invited to serve tea to the Earth King. The elated general runs off excitedly towards the rear of the tea house. Zuko watches him go with a smile, then resumes sweeping as the camera draws back out the entrance. Meanwhile in the backup location of Lake Ligao, the Dai Li members who were fiercely loyal to Long Feng had gathered. They were all gathered in the dark hallway underground. On both sides of it are enormous ancient statues. In the middle are many Dai Li agents, all lined up in rows. Azula, accompanied by Mai and Tai Li in their disguises, stood on top of a statue's pedestal and addressed the Dai Li. The Earth King and the Council of Five do not trust the Dai Li. They imprisoned your leader, Long Feng. Soon they will turn on all of you and eliminate you. Seizing power today is a matter of life and Ku must be swift and decisive. The Earth King and each of the five generals must be taken out simultaneously. Long Feng has placed you in my command while we overthrow the government. Azula walks toward a Dai Li agent with a scar on his cheek and look him in the eyes. If I sense any disloyalty, any hesitation, any weakness at all, I will snuff it out. That is all. The agent watches Azula nervously as she walks away. The Dai Li turn and all begin walking away. Azula climbs back up the steps as Tai Li pours her a cup of tea. Nice speech Azula. It was pretty and poetic, but also scary in a good way. Tai Li praised the princess. The way you were going on I thought that one soldier was going to defecate himself. Mai noted with a hint of amusement. There are still a few loose ends the avatar and my brother and uncle. Azula noted as Naruto shoeshined into the room wrapping his arms around Azula's waist. Very impressive, he said as his chin rested on her head. I knew the rest of the plan would be fine in your capable hands. All that is left is for all the pieces to come into place. So what's up with you coming and going Naruto? I don't see why you can't send one of those clone or yours in your place like you usually do. In other words it was Azula's way of saying she missed his presence without coming off as sappy. Now miss me? He teased as a growl escaped her lips. She's right you know. Mai noted as for a moment she couldn't help but wonder why Naruto gave so much attention to Azula. Seems like you've been rather busy. Just making sure everything runs smoothly. You don't think a complicated multi-step plan like this is going to somehow go off just as planned. I already had to capture and confine several Dai Li members while the Avatar and friends were kept busy and didn't come and blow your covers. In other words, a general happened to find a few scrolls that brought their attention to their personal business outside of Ba Sing Si. The fact that Long Fen managed to intercept them was a stroke of luck on our part. He said as he fell silent after the announcement. His mind drifting off to the scroll of the guru who wished to help Ong unlock his eight chakras. If Ong were to unlock his eight chakras and master the avatar state, he might actually become strong enough to force Naruto to fight him seriously. I wasn't expecting this little development, but if Ong masters his eight chakras, he'll be taking his first big step onto the right path. If he's willing to understand the lessons I'm trying to teach him then there may be hope after all. It was after this Naruto realized what might end up being a problem. Ong's infatuation with Katara, speaking of which, he needed to make sure she would be out of the way. I wish to stay in chat, but I have to make sure the Water Tribe girl doesn't end up stumbling upon something she shouldn't. If that's the case I'll be pleased to inform you that we've already captured her. Azula noted as Naruto raised an eyebrow in interest. Oh? Naruto curiously responded. She came to tell the Kayashi warriors about my uncle and Zuzu. As such she is in the catacombs under the city where her water bending abilities will be ineffective in escaping. HHM, well that takes care of another potential problem. Speaking of which aren't you expecting some company? He asked as Azula nodded and addressed Mai and Tai Li. It's time to get into place girls. We don't want to keep our guests waiting. She informed then and turned back to Naruto. So Naruto, how do you feel about tea? Elsewhere in the Eastern Air Temple the Avatar hit a snag in his training. 
Well Guru Pathak helped him unlock 7 out of 8 of his chakras, the avatar could not unlock the 8 one, meaning he would have to give up what he loved the most. I'm sorry, but I can't let go of Katara. Ong, to master the avatar state, you must open all the chakras. Surrender yourself. The guru calmly informed him. If what you said about this stranger that threatens to bring imbalance to the world, you will need access to the full power of the avatar state. Okay, I'll try. Ong focuses his concentration. Inside his mind, mountains beneath a starry sky could be seen. The heavens begin to spin with great speed, the stars blurring streaks that disappear behind the mountains. An image of Katara appears and drifts back toward the horizon to finally vanish with a twinkle of light. The heavens cease to whirl. Now, think of your attachments and let them go. Guru Pathak's voice spoke to him. An image of Katara appears and drifts back toward the horizon to finally vanish with a twinkle of light. The sky ceases to spin. Let the pure cosmic energy flow. Looking up into the stars, an aurora of light could be seen. On was floating in space above the planet and the aurora solidifies into a radiant bridge beneath his feet. Turning from the world below, Ong sees a massive entity standing above snaking path. It is a spectral figure of Ong himself, the tattoos and eyes shining with the light of the avatar state. Ong sets off carefully towards it, mouth open in awe. As he nears the feet of the hovering apparition, his own tattoos begin to shine with light. The towering, spectral Ong descends a sphere of light shimmering between its fingers. The avatar is enclosed within this shell, but suddenly he is distracted by a cry of distress. Ong sees a vision of Katara chained to a wall, demanding to be freed. He leaps from the hands of the apparition, and the sphere of light vanishes. Behind him, the great entity fades from sight as he rushes back down the path. It too begins to fade rapidly until it drops him to plunge screaming toward the world. Ong suddenly starts from his meditative trance. Katara is in danger. I have to go. He said as he rose in alarm. Ong turns and races away, sliding down the roof of the tower. The Rupatha calls after him. No Ong. By choosing attachment, you have locked the chakra. Ong draws to a stop. If you leave now you won't be able to go into the avatar state at all. But if you don't leave then the water tribe girl might not make it. A voice spoke, alerting the guru and Ong to show's presence. Time is running out avatar Ong. Naruto has grown tired of this game and decided that he and now you will fight to decide once and for all who is right. Only one man will leave Ba Sing Si alive, so if you want to save the water tribe girl you return now. But that finished the clone faded in a pop of smoke. Avatar Ong if you don't master the avatar state you might not stand much of a chance at all. The guru tried to reason with Ong, afraid he might put the balance of the world in danger in exchange for his own desires. I can't just abandon Katara. She needs me. The world needs you. Ong pauses for a moment at the edge of the roof and then leaps down. Guru Patha closes his eyes with a mournful expression. Ong rides Appa away from the temple at great speed. The ambush was partially effective. While Iroh may have escaped Zuko had been captured and would be placed under the catacomb same as Katara. That left Ong, Toph, Iroh, and Sokka to mount a rescue effort. Putting their differences aside, they began mounting a rescue effort to save Zuko and Katara, so they quickly left for the palace. Speaking of the palace Long Feng was meditating in his cell, his eyes closed, while conversing with a Dai Li agent outside. The movements of all the generals and the Earth King have been plotted out step by step. Good. And the Fire Nation princess is cooperating. He asked, prodding his subordinate for information. Oh yes. More than cooperating, she's really taken charge. She's terrifying and inspirational all at the same time. It's hard to explain. The agent uncertain of just what to think of the princess answered before leaving. Long Feng opens his eyes for a moment, full of suspicion. Underground on the way to the catacombs Ong and Iroh conversed. Ong is tunneling down using his earth bending, and Iroh is lighting the way with a flame cupped in his hand. There is a moment of uncomfortable silence between the two until Ong decides to break the ice. So, Ta thinks you give pretty good advice and great tea. Ong started, trying to break the ice. The key to both is proper aging. What's on your mind? Ong pauses for a second to deepen the tunnel with an earthbending movement before continuing. Well, I met with this guru who was supposed to help me master the avatar state and control this great power. But to do it, I had to let go of someone I love, and I just couldn't. He exclaimed as he felt forlorn. Perfection and power are overrated. I think you were very wise to choose happiness and love. They stop again, and Ong pushes back the earth with a wave of his arms. What happens if we can't save everyone? Beat Naruto and Azula. Without the avatar state, what if I am not powerful enough? I don't know the answer. Sometimes life is like this dark tunnel. You can't always see the light at the end of the tunnel, but if you just keep moving they came to one last wall of rocks. Ong pushes both arms forward, earth bending the rocks out of the way. A green light shines through. 
Iroh smiles as the flame in his hand extinguishes and a green light washes over him. Ong and Iroh walk forward and enter the crystal catacombs. We will come to a better place. The catacombs are full of glowing green crystals, stalagmites and stalactites. In the back of the area is a waterfall pouring into a channel forming two rectangles around several thick jagged columns. Change scenes to the palace. Sokka, Toph and Momo are climbing the steep steps towards the entrance. Sokka and Toph arrived a little too late too as the generals were taken down one by one the Dai Li. The coup is happening now. We've got to warn the Earth King. Sokka grabs Toph and they run towards the throne room. The Earth King is sitting in his throne with Bosco by his side. Mai and Tai Li were still in disguise in there as well. Thank goodness we're in time. Sokka said in relief. In time for what? The Earth King asked curiously. Yeah, what are you in time for what? Tai Li asked as she somersault forwards and lands near them. Do I know you? Tai Li asked as she narrowed an eye and placed her face pretty close to his. Uh, I'm the guy that's involved with your leader Suki. He uneasily informed the girl as something about her was familiar. Who? Offer it bends a rock underneath Tai Li. She gives a small shout as she is hurled into the air. Tai Li flips backward and lands on top of the badger mole statue in the back of the room. They're not the real Kayashi warriors. Toph shouted as the Earth King gasped in shock. Sorry to disappoint you. Mai countered as she flings three double-bladed daggers at Toph. Toph Earth bends a slab of rock in front of her and blocks the projectiles. She then kicked the slab, sending it flying at Mai, who jumped over it. A moment after she landed, Toph used her earth bending to pop a stone up from underneath Mai, knocking her away. Toph grins victoriously. Stand still will you? Tai Li whined as she attempted to strike the water tribe warrior's pressure points, but he was moving too quickly. Every time Tai Li tried to hit a joint or spot on his body, Sokka ducked, leaned, and shifted out of the way, often ending up in an awkward position. You're quick, but Naruto is quicker. She airily taunted him which caused Sokka to let out a growl. This fight is over. Azula announced her presence causing the fighters to look up. Azula was standing behind the Earth King and holding him by the shoulder. The frightened king stares at the blue flame Azula holds close to his head. Sokka and Toph raise their hands and surrender. Tai Li jumps between them and disables Sokka with a series of strikes. Momo soars through the air and tries to escape, but a Dai Li agent that had entered the throne room with Azula throws his stone gloves at Momo. They wrap around the lemur, and Tai Li watches as Momo falls next to her. Azula roughly shoves the Earth King away. This was too easy. Naruto commented as he entered the room. And now to take care of the last loose ends. Off. What are you doing standing there? Run away. Get out of there. Sokka shouted at Toph only to fall into silent shock when Naruto wrapped his arms around Toph's waist and pulled her into a passionate kiss. You traitor. How could you? He couldn't believe this was happening. One of their friends was betraying them yet again. The kiss broke and Toph shrugged. Sorry Sokka but let's be honest. I never really belonged with you guys. I wanted my freedom and I agreed to join you guys for that purpose. I just can't live a life where I follow the same teachings and ideals passed down for generations without anything being changed. What am I to become if I continue with you guys? Just another earthbending master. The girl who taught the avatar. Also Naruto can give me things you guys can't. He can give me the ability to see and true freedom, not to mention he wants to help the world. Even if Ong defeats the Fire Lord here and now what's to stop someone like Azai from pulling off the same thing two, three, or five centuries from now? And what happens if the avatar of that time does what Ong does, but this time he or she doesn't come back? What happens when the people wait for the avatar to solve their problems and they don't get their savior? That is not the kind of world I want my descendants to live in. As she finished this Naruto crouched down and jabbed two fingers into Sokka's head, resulting in him losing consciousness. Naruto turned to the Earth King. As you see my king the salvation of the world shouldn't have been left in the hands of a group of children. If it wasn't for my intervention you and your generals would have been executed. But even now our forces aren't enough. If we are going to crush Azai and his supporters, we are going to need one solid force. Earth, water, and those of noble fire must band together to extinguish the corrupted inferno that it tends to engulf this world. Long Feng went as far as to enlist Azula's help to regain control of Ba Sing Si and even now had supporters. Who's to say they don't extend beyond the Dai Li? Your life may continue to be in danger so I ask you, will you accept our offer? Will you go along with our deception and prevent the lives of any Earth Nation citizens from being lost? The Earth King sighed and rubbed the head of his pet Bosco. After years of being controlled by Long Feng the Earth King was not confident he was the leader his people needed. Now he found himself with two choices, could either agree to this alliance or be killed, which would allow someone else to take his place. At least this way he would have some real say in what happens to his kingdom, even though he wouldn't be in it. Very well. 
Naruto nodded, and as we agreed this kingdom will return to you once the war is over. We hope with your aid we can finally begin to heal century-long wounds. It's time Azula spoke up as Naruto nodded. Naruto waved over Mei Ling who for the past few weeks had been in the background. Have you managed to find out the identity of all Long Feng supporters? He asked as the mute nodded. Good you, Mai, and Tai Li hunt down and capture them. If we can't convert them then just suggest to them they really don't want to die for Long Feng's goals. He said as the three girls went off to do their part of the plan. Naruto picked up the unconscious Sokka and slung him over his shoulder while he led the Earth King and Bosco away. Long Feng entered the throne room just in time. He was followed by troops of the Dai Li, all lined in rows. They all stand before Azula. Now comes the part where I double-cross you. Dai Li, arrest the Fire Nation princess. He ordered but they did not respond. Long Feng turns to them, frowning, and points at Azula. I said, arrest her. He looks back and forth at the agents and loses his patience. What is wrong with you? It's because they haven't made up their minds. They're waiting to see how this is going to end. Azula informed him with a smug look as everything was going just as planned. What are you talking about? He asked as he narrowed his eyes. I can see your whole history in your eyes. You were born with nothing. So you had to struggle and connive and claw your way to power. But true power, the divine right to rule is something you're born with. The fact is, they don't know which one of us is going to be sitting on that throne and which one is going to be bowing down. But I know. And you know. Long Feng begins to sweat. His face is full of hesitation and uncertainty. Azula sits on the Earth King's throne and crosses her legs. I am the one with the power and resources. In fact at my very side I have a being more powerful than my father, more powerful than the Avatar, and a cunning that matches if not exceeds my own. At the end of this statement Naruto's six paths entered the room, all joining Azula's side. And with his utter devotion and loyalty. So tell me Long Feng, what do you have? Long Feng was now truly frightened. Beads of sweat roll down his face as his mouth hangs open, speechless. Azula stares at him cold and intently. Long Feng closes his eyes and drops his head, realizing that he has lost. Long Feng steps forward and bows before Azula. You've beaten me at my own game. Don't flatter yourself. Azula countered with a smug grin. You were never even a player. Down in the catacombs Katara and Zuko were having a bonding moment and coming to understand each other. Just when she was about to use the water from the spirit oasis to heal his scar Ong bursts into the tunnel with Iro. Ong. Ong stares at Zuko and Katara, confused by how close they are, before Katara runs up to him and they embrace in a warm hug. Ong glares at Zuko while still holding Katara. Iroh runs up to Zuko and hugs him around the shoulders. Zuko glares back at the avatar. Katara placed her hands on Ong's shoulders and gives him another hug. Ong, I knew you would come. Uncle, I don't understand. Zuko began, visibly upset. What are you doing with the avatar? Saving you, that's what. Ong answered for Iroh which seemed to set off the firebender. Zuko snarls at Ong and tries to lunge at him, but Iroh grabs him, preventing him from causing a fight. Zuko, it's time we talked. Iroh then turns to Ong and Katara. Go help your other friends. We'll catch up with you. Ong clasps his hands and bows respectfully to Iroh before running back through the hole in the cave. Katara slowly follows after him. She turns her head and takes one last sad glimpse at a sullen Zuko before exiting. Zuko turns his head away from Iroh. Why uncle? Zuko asked, clearly hurt. You are not the man you used to be, Zuko. You are stronger and wiser and freer than you have ever been. And now you have come to the crossroads of your destiny. It's time for you to choose. It's time for you to choose good. Zuko shuts his eyes, absorbing his uncle's words. Before he can process this wisdom, Zuko was startled by a violent quake. A trail of crystals shoots out of the ground until they reach Iroh, trapping him. Zuko readies himself for an attack. Azula and two Dai Li agents lie down from the tunnel Zuko had entered through. Azula advances toward Zuko until his is directly between his uncle and his sister. I expected this kind of treachery from uncle, but Zuko, Prince Zuko you're a lot of things, but you're not a traitor, are you? She asked, surprised by Zuko's actions. Release him immediately. Zuko demanded as he moved into a bending stance. It's not too late for you Zuko. You can still redeem yourself. She said as she offered up a hand. The kind of redemption she offers is not for you. Why don't you let him decide, uncle? She remarked before turning to her brother. I need you Zuko. For weeks this plan has gone on, with each step bringing the Fire Nation growing closer to its former glory, to bring an end of this war and have a worthwhile Fire Lord sitting on the throne. One that is not blinded by his own selfish indulgence that he has weakened our nation. Both Zuko and Ira were shocked by Azula's words. She was every bit of devoted to Ozai as a human being could be to their lord was possible, but to hear her actually speak about betraying Ozai and becoming Fire Lord in his stead. 
Zuko, I am begging you, look into your heart and see what it is that you truly want. Zuko looks back at Iroh. He is unsure of whom to listen to. He shuts his eyes and hangs his head, trying to come to a decision. You are free to choose. She said as Naruto entered the catacombs. Looks like we've reached the climax of this story. Naruto said as he appeared behind Ong and Katara. Sokka. Katara cried out in distress upon seeing her unconscious brother. What did you do to him? He's just unconscious. He answered as he let Sokka drop to the ground. Katara rushed over to check on her brother as Naruto went and joined Azula's side. Your actions caused this avatar Ong. For the life of one girl you've risked your destiny and the hope of this world. Naruto declared as he folded his arms. You were so easy to manipulate. You chose personal attachments over mastering the avatar state, and now Ba Sing Si will fall, you and your friends will be captured, and the Earth Kingdom will fall. No. I won't let it happen. I won't run anymore Naruto. I won't let you do as you please anymore. I'll defeat you here and now and I'll protect the world. Ong said as he brandished his staff. He couldn't hesitate, not anymore. Defeat me? Naruto asked in amusement. I've been waiting for this moment. The moment you would look at me as your enemy. Now show me what you can do. He said as he went into sage mode. Naruto shouted as he jumped into the air and dropped down at Ong. His powerful fist uprooting the earth as Ong was forced to the left, while Katara dragged Sokka out of the way. Come on Sokka wake up. The frantic bender pleaded, shaking her brother's shoulder. She looked up and ducked under a burst of flame. You have other things to worry about water bender. Asla remarked as her fingertips were smoking from the attack. Reluctant to leave her brother the repeated attacks forced Katara to jump back. Bending the water in the channel she charges at Azula and brings the water crashing down on her. Azula deflects the attack with a short blast of fire. Katara keeps her momentum and spins the water around her, smashing it into the floor and creating a large wave. Azula stomps the ground and flings her hands out, making a wall of fire that evaporates the wave coming at her. The resulting steam hides Azula and Naruto from view. Ong and Katara look left and right, preparing for a sneak attack. Faster than they can react Naruto burst from the ring. He notices the surprise look in their eyes and uses Shinra Tensei to blast Ong away. Katara's head whipped to the direction of where Ong was sent and was about to help when Azula jumps out of the steam from one of the larger crystals high above. She attacks with a fireball which Katara extinguished by bending the water from the channel into a shield. She was about to retaliate when she found the channel of water being engulfed by a giant summoned snake. She then found herself being enveloped by sand. Naruto you monster. Didn't our time in the North Pole mean anything to you? Was all of it a lie? Katara cried out as she could feel the tears that threatened to fall from her eyes. There is more to what's going on than you can hope to understand Kat. Also to answer the question, no, it was all genuine. Everything I did and said was the honest truth. I do this because I am your friend, and you guys will understand why I'm doing what I'm doing, Naruto was cut off as the paths, and Asla dodged out of the way of a rampaging giant. Katara unceremoniously dropped down to the ground and was offered a hand up. Jet. We have your back Katara. He said as all the freedom fighters got in front of her. Now go help Ong. I'm not sure how you lot managed to find us, but you should have stayed away. The paths charged forward at the freedom fighters. Naruto and Azula were taking Ong and Katara on even ground. Being decisive may have had a slight improvement on your ability to fight Ong, but it's not enough. Naruto remarked, continuing to try to fill the avatar's head with doubt. Before any of them could attack a blast of red fire landed between them. They all shield themselves from it and turn towards the new opponent, Zuko. He is wearing a simple brown shirt and brown pants, having shed his outer robes. Zuko draws closer to them, poised in his fire-bending stance. He looks to Azula, who gazes back at him harshly. Zuko then looks to Ong. The airbender gasps just before Zuko punches Send, shooting a fireball at him. Ong reacts just in time and protects himself by airbending a spiral of wind around his body. He jumps back to gain distance as the flame dispersed. Azula smiles at Zuko's decision and attacks Katara, waving her arm in an arc and throwing a jet of fire at the waterbender with an underhand toss. Katara bends the water from her flask and extinguishes the fire. Naruto pops up behind Ong and elbow the airbender in the back, sending him stumble forward with a cry of pain. He was just able to avoid a flurry of fireballs Zuko furiously launched at him. Naruto shot forward and was about to throw another punch when a dagger blindsided him and cut his cheek. Naruto's head lashed to the side from the blade, and his wound began to bleed. He let loose a snarl as his eyes traced to the attacker which was none other than Jet. You shouldn't have done that freedom fighter. That's the first part of the payback for stabbing me asshole. Jet said as he brought out his two signature twin hooked swords. Charging forward with he was met with a Shinra Tensei which propelled Jet backwards with a blast of air. Jet slows himself with the hooks of his swords, which spark against a stone, charge forward again and took to the air. 
As he lands, Jet swings both hook swords down at Naruto who jumped out of the way. Naruto jumped into the air and spin kicked at Jet's midsection. Jet somersaulted away and landed in a crouching position before charging forward at Naruto again. The blonde whipped out a pair of kunai from his pouch. Both weapons clashed together briefly before both combatants jumped apart. Jet runs after him and did a few spins before striking at Naruto with both swords. Naruto blocked the strike, and both combatants lock weapons. The duke as he was called was the youngest and smallest of the freedom fighters. He found himself being yanked from Pipsqueak's broad shoulders by an unexpected arrival. At long last I get to do something. Mei Ling thought as he brought out the fans that were procured from the Kayashi warriors. But the roar Pipsqueak attempted to charge the mute girl only for her to shoot forward with frightening speed. Using the edge of the fan to jab into him, she used a swift kick to knock him off his feet and used the momentum to send him flying. Unfurling the other fan she deflected an arrow from the freedom fighter's archer. She began moving along the uneven ground of the cavern as she used the fans to deflect the arrows. Smellerby armed with a blade swiped and stabbed at Naruto in an attempt to assist Jet, but he somehow seemed able to ignore all her attacks with ease without so much as looking at her. Stop ignoring me. Smellerby growled as she continued to swipe at the silver-haired man. Now, now little boy that's not how you treat someone you're senior. What would your parents say? Naruto asked as Smellerby let out a scream of outrage. I am a girl. The face-painted rebel shouted. Uh, Naruto remarked, you learn something new every day. He said before quickly drawing some water from the nearby lake, using it to freeze the girl in place from the shins down. Leave her alone and fight me coward. Jet roared as he ran at Naruto to close the distance between them. Howard. Naruto chuckled. Oh no, I'm just making sure your friend doesn't get caught in the crossfire. He said as he extended his arms. Chakra began gathering in his hands as two orbs began to form. This ends here and now freedom fighter. He said as he extended a leg back and watched as Jet continued to run at him, bringing his swords up as he prepared a double slash. Rasenrengan. Naruto's two Rasengans collided into Jet's swords. After a moment the two hook swords were broken, the edges of it falling down to the ground with a clang. Naruto then slammed his head forward against Jet's head and watched as his opponent fell back to the ground with a groan. He then found himself being charged by another one of the freedom fighters. Back with Zuko and Ong the former continued to assault the later with a rapid barrage of fireballs. Ong quickly ran around in a circle at high speed, creating a whirlwind that blocks the attacks. With his momentum built up, Ong came to a halt and throws his chest out, sending forth a gust of air in the shape of his body. Zuko gasped just as the gust hits him, blowing him back several feet and knocking him to the ground. Ong leaped forward and attempted to attack Zuko with a blast of wind, but Zuko rolls out of the way and counters with a blast of fire to Ong's legs. Ong jumps high into the air and lands on a column. Zuko springs to his feet and shoots more fireballs in Ong's direction. Ong hops out of the way and lands on the tip of a large pointy crystal sticking out of the stone wall high above. Zuko lowered his stance and coiled his body, gathering energy, and launches a mighty blast of fire at the avatar. Ong lifted his arms, earth bending the crystals below him to rise up and block the attack. The fire blast was too strong and exploded on contact, shattering the crystals. Zuko pulled back his still flaming fist and brings both fists down to his sides, creating two large thick flames. Waving his arms, Zuko turned the flames into long, searing whips of fire. Ong recovered and readied himself for this new attack, crouching on top of a cluster of crystals. Zuko swung both whips at Ong, who jumps away as the fire whip slice through the crystals. Ong landed at the stop of a cliff, but had no time to relax as Zuko followed up the attack. Ong jumped over the burning whips and onto a nearby column. Zuko slung the fire around and continued his relentless attack. Azula meanwhile, was contending with Katara. She and Katara run towards each other. Katara stops and bends the puddle, lifting it up with one arm and thrusting it at Azula with the other. Azula watched the water pass just inches by her face and cut a few hairs from her bangs. Zuko spun his fire whips over his head. He swings the burning tendrils at Ong, who is clinging to a stalactite. Ong jumped away to another stalactite, and the fire whips cut through the one he was just on. Ong pushed off the stalactite with his legs and kicks another one, causing its tip to break and fall off. Ong grabbed the upper part still attached to the ceiling, swings down under it and kicks off, hurling himself down. Ong turned himself right side up and slams his fists down into the falling stalactite, plunging it down. The stone hits the floor, kicking up dust and creating a crater. Zuko was blown back by the shock wave, and his body hits a crystal cluster. Katara bends the puddle on the ground and lobs it at Azula, knocking her to her knees. As Azula started to get back to her feet, Katara bends the water all around her body. The waterbender creates two long tentacles of water where her arms are and lifts them high into the air. Azula brought her hands together and quickly performed the hand seals. 
mimicking the gestures Naruto thought it resulted in forming a grand fireball, which extinguished a water tentacle that was about to snag Azula. She found that the gestures made it easier to influence her Kai and alter her bending in a matter that allowed her bending to mimic jutsu attacks that were theoretically possible with bending, but had yet to be successfully pulled off. Leaping to the side Katara landed and manipulating a burst of water, launching at Azula who saw it coming and dodged under the techniques. She then used a tentacle to wrap an arm around Azula to prevent her from using her next technique. Though, before Katara could form another tentacle a burst of flame caused the tentacle to by a large flame arc, courtesy of Zuko. The arc of fire passes over the channel and slices through the water tentacles, freeing Azula. Azula smiles at her brother before turning her attention to Ong as he crawls out of the crater, still dizzy by his last attack. Azula set her eyes on the airbender and lunges after him. Zuko throws two lances of fire at Katara, which she extinguishes with her water tentacles. I thought you had changed. Katara swings her water down at Zuko which clasped with Zuko's attack, both equal in strength. I have changed. Zuko brings his hand up and chops horizontally, sending out another blast of fire. Azula and Ong face off. Azula smiles confidently while Long looks determined to win. This time we won't be interrupted. Azula brings her hands up and pushes them back while stepping forward, creating two large burning balls of blue fire. She shifts her feet and jets off fire shoot from her soles, the small explosions causing her to rocket forward. Ong raises his arms and earth bends the crystals around him, covering his body with them and creating suit of glistening green armor. He puts both arms forward and slides over the ground, coming at Azula head on. Both look like they are about to collide until Azula hops and slides her foot forward, flinging all of the built up fire at Ong. Ong crosses his arms and tries to defend himself, but the powerful attack shatters the crystal armor and sends Ong crashing into a wall on a cliff up above. Zuko chops down, flinging one of his fiery whips at Katara, who deflects it with her water tentacle. As Katara counterattacks, Azula leaps from the top of a crystal cluster and shoots a blast of fire down at her. Katara deflects the attack and another blast of fire from Zuko by bending her water into a wall. Zuko swings an arc of fire and Azula shoots a blue fireball. The fireball makes a direct hit and Katara is blown back, colliding with a cluster of crystals. She falls to the ground, unconscious. Katara's hair has come undone and flows freely. Azula and Zuko turn their heads towards a rumbling noise. Ong launches dozens of feet into the air, kicking up an enormous dust cloud. Ong slams his body into the floor, cracking the stone ground, and a moment later comes charging at the firebenders by riding on a rolling mound of rock. Zuko and Azula ready themselves for the attack. Ong is furious and determined, but just as he gets close, Naruto pops up, destroying his earth mound with a chakra-enhanced punch, sending Ong to the floor. Ong wearily picks himself up and looks around. Many Dai Li agents jump down from the cliffs above, forming long rows behind the trio. It's over Avatar Ong. You've been beaten. Naruto noted as Katara regained consciousness only to be restrained by some of the agents. Am I too late to the party? Toph asked as she rode an earth wave and came to a stop between the trio and Ong. Toph. Both Ong and Katara shouted in alarm. You have to get out of here before you get captured too. Katara shouted to her. Upon seeing Toph casually strolled over to Naruto's side, Katara immediately screamed out, Toph. What are you doing? Sorry Katara, but I'm taking Naruto up on his offer. I want to see this better world with my own two eyes and live my own destiny. Toph informed Naruto who smiled. Toph. How could you? Don't you realize you're jeopardizing the balance of the entire world? Ong shouted as he threw his arm to the side. I thought you were my teacher. I thought we were friends. How could you betray us like this? How could this have happened? You wouldn't understand. Toph responded as she turned her head to face them. I don't want to be yet another person who needlessly relies on you, the avatar for my destiny. With my own feet I will walk my path and choose my fate, with my own hands I will take on anything that stands in that path, and with my own eyes I will see it through. I am disappointed Toph Bay Frong. Iroh jumps down from a cliff and lands between the group and Ong, entering his battle stance. Old man Iroh. Toph paused, regretful but still willing to go down her path. This is the path I've chosen to live and one day I hope we can someday be on the same side. She said as he moved into a fighting position. You've got to get out of here. I'll hold them off as long as I can. Iroh shouted to Ong as he punches left, center and right, shooting fire blasts at any potential attackers. He lowers his stance and defends against the stone gloves that Dai Li agents throw at him. Iroh waves both hands forward and flings powerful blast of fire from his fingertips. Ong made a mad dash for Katara, only to be cut off by Naruto. Not this time. You aren't getting away this time. The blonde remarked as he narrowed his eyes. A palm strike to Ong's chest sent the avatar flying back into the wall and losing consciousness. The avatar has been captured. All obstacles have been dealt with. 
Naruto finished as his paths were soon able to subdue General Iroh and restrain him. Take the Avatar and his friends where the Earth King is being kept. Naruto ordered as he pointed out two Dai Li agents for the task. Zuko though still seemed torn between indecision on the choice he made. The trip for the most part was quiet as they all returned to the palace. Azula was sitting on the throne with Zuko on her left and Naruto on its right. After a century Ba Sing Si has fallen. Not the climactic battle most pictured. I betrayed uncle. Zuko regretfully muttered. You chose to join us or you could follow your own path Zuko. In time your uncle will come to realize that the beliefs he follows aren't without flaws. After all he was a loyal general of the Fire Nation who before today came closer than anyone of taking over Ba Sing Si taking before his change of heart. Though now you're on the first step to making the Fire Nation a better place. For over three long years Zuko had waited for this day. With the Avatar captured his honor would soon be restored by his father. But between Naruto's words, Azula's new goals, and betraying his uncle Zuko, didn't know what to do. What to think. Boy Breedy buck up already. Naruto said as he nudged the thinking prince. Tonight we celebrate a hard-earned victory. Since the party was on short notice not that many exquisite dishes were made. Though things like noodle soup were made along with tofu curd and egg custard tart. With a cog a bunch and Naruto created a hinged as the Earth King, no one was the wiser. A few hours after the party had begun Azula had retreated to one of the private rooms. Azula still didn't get along too well with people, especially not enough to enjoy a big party, and she certainly had no idea how to host one. Tai Li like always was a bundle of energy and gained the attention of nearly everyone. Currently she seemed to be bugging Toph who was struggling with the choice or whether or not to use earthbending to launch the girl in space, and apparently even Zuko was busy with some girl by the name of Jin, who was calling him Lee for some reason. Mai assumed it must have been some girl he met while incognito, and for a moment she felt angry. Why do I care? It's not like I still like him do I? Mai tried to reason to herself as she turned away from the sight. I thought I was over these old feelings. It was just a crush. I haven't seen him in years. Excuse me miss, I couldn't help but notice you from across the room. I would be honored if you would dance with me. It was none other than Naruto dressed in green young royal robes befitting that of royalty asking her to dance. I'd love to she said, taking his hand as they went to the dance floor, hoping that she would be able to sort these feelings she had. That no good traitor. Meanwhile at the same time in the jail cell the members of the gang had come too. They found themselves handcuffed and chained without their weapons or a speck of water. After all we did for her she does this. Sokka ranted as Katara sighed. I failed them. I failed everyone. Ong said as he clasped his face with his hands, looking up when he sensed some hands placed on his shoulders. He looked up and noticed it was Katara who was trying to comfort him. It's not your fault Ong. We did the best we could. We can only hope that somehow, someway, that everything will somehow work out. Katara informed him trying to muster as much confidence as she could, but Toph's betrayal had hit her pretty hard and she didn't feel very hopeful at the moment. It seems you and I share a common enemy. A voice spoke out from the other side of the Dai Li members that were guarding them. Feathers materialized as the agents fell to the ground dead sleep. I can free you and can give you all the tools you'll need to defeat Naruto and break your friend from his hold. He has an unusual power that compels others to his side, after all influencing the princess of the Fire Nation to his side proves that. The voice finished as a black clothes figure walked into view. His figure was about 4 or 5 inches short of being 6 feet and his body was quite wide. Who are you? And how do you know Naruto? Whoever this person was he unnerved Ong, even more so than Naruto. Something about his aura was wrong. I am but another person whose life was ruined by Naruto. Cursed into a body that's not my own. We can help each other. I mean, what other choice do you have? The mysterious person asked. Ong contemplated the words as he struggled with what to do. But remembering that he if gave up now then everything that he did ever since awakened all those months ago would have been for nothing. I'll do it. Ong agreed as the clothed person chuckled. Excellent. Let me introduce myself my name is. End chapter. So this part ends here. If you want to see next part of this series. Like the video now and share the story with your friends. Bye bye.